Hey, everybody. I'm Jason Howell. And earlier today, did a podcast with Jeff Jarvis, another episode of AI Inside. We had a very special guest, Dr. Emil Torres, who actually, along with Timnit Gebru, uh, coined the term Tescriol. And if you've been following AI and AGI development and everything, you've probably heard about Tescriol largely and specifically because of Emil Torres and Timnit Gebru, because they coined the term. It's a really important episode, an important interview. And so we thought this time around, we just released the interview separate of the podcast. If you want to check out the full podcast, the interview is there. Feel free and download it. Subscribe, AIinside.show. Or you can just watch the interview with Emil Torres. That's coming up right now. We are going to have a little bit of a flashback to the the previous incarnation of AI Inside when I worked at Twit, twit.tv. Um, Jeff and I were basically trialing this show for a number of months and kind of building what it would be. And uh, we had the opportunity to talk with an impressive uh, person, today's guest, in fact, Dr. Emil Torres, who is philosopher, historian, has a focus on existential risk and human extinction of which there is plenty of fodder right He's now unfortunately my goodness not sure why why you did that to yourself emil this is that's got to be hard sometimes but um you last year published the book human extinction a history of the science and ethics of annihilation and i mean i, I could go on collaboration with dr timnit gebru um uh, basically y'all coined the term Tescreal, which comes up on the show so often. So, Emil, it's great to have you back. Although on this show, you haven't been on at Twit, you were. But anyways, it's great to have you here, Emil. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wonderful and I, to be here. Yeah, it's, it's really great to talk with you again. And um, when I reached out, I think like a month and a half ago, you had mentioned that you had an FAQ on the Tescreal bundle uh, coming soon. Mm -hmm. And so we decided, hey, that's a really great opportunity to bring you on. And then, of course, I went away to Italy, so uh, it, it had to delay a little bit. But just last month to your Substack, that's xriskology.substack.com. Hope I got that right. Um, the Test Grill Bundle FAQ hit the site, hit the, hit your uh, Substack. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today because I know people you know, hear us talk about Tess Grial and we talk about it in bits and pieces, but I feel like when it com you know, comes down to it, you, you know, you're one of the people that's really driving awareness around this. And uh, you know, like I said, you coined the term <laughs> Tess Grial. So you of all people are the right person to talk. So uh, talk about this. So why don't we start with the basics and uh, then we'll get into a little bit about what's in the, the, the FAQ and, and go from there. Um, I know we covered this a little bit previously, but for those who didn't watch, what is Tess Grail? We'll just start with the simplest question. Or is that simple? I don't even know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's relatively speaking, it's simple. Yeah. Uh, so this, the concept of the test grill bundle, uh, this was the result of a collaboration that I was working on with Dr. Timmy Gebru, uh, computer scientist used to work at Google. And we were specifically trying to understand what are the various ideologies that have shaped and are driving the current race to build AGI or artificial general intelligence. And in the paper, um, we, writing the paper, we found to be somewhat um, unwieldy uh, uh, because we could not talk about the origins of the uh, current race to build AGI without mentioning these seven ideologies. And so at some point, I proposed the acronym TESCREAL in order to economize our speech and streamline our conversation so that we weren't just listing these seven ideologies, which are uh, represented linguistically by these, these quite large polysyllabic terms like transhumanism and singularitarianism and, and so on. And kind of the, once we had the test grill acronym, uh, it occurred to us that it really does, there, there are compelling reasons for thinking of these ideologies as constituting, uh, and their various, um, the, the communities that have coalesced around each uh, ideology in the, the acronym, as constituting a cohesive movement 
that really goes back to the late 1980s with the emergence of modern transhumanism, which coincided, it was coincidental with uh, um, extropianism, the first organized transhumanist movement, extending from the late 1980s, early 1990s, all the way up to the present. So we thought like, actually in the, the test cruel FAQ, I mentioned that there are two possible interpretations of the test cruel thesis. One is the weak, uh, you could call the weak thesis, and the other is the strong thesis. The weak thesis simply states that you cannot provide a complete explanatory picture of the current race to build AGI without referencing these seven ideologies. Referencing these seven ideologies is absolutely crucial for making sense of what's going on. The strong thesis is that these ideologies really do form this bundle. Uh, and in our paper, we defend uh, both. So we, we also, we, we, in particular, we defend the, the strong thesis that we really should be thinking about this, these ideologies as just a, a, a single wriggling organism that extends from the late 1980s uh, all the way up to the present. So all of that being said, the acronym itself stands for transhumanism, extropianism, singularitarianism, cosmism, rationalism, effective altruism, and long-termism. And I'm happy to, to uh, discuss what each of these ideologies are, but essentially they, the, the, you could think of the backbone of the test cruel bundle as transhumanism, because all of the other ideologies really just grew out of the transhumanist or modern transhumanist movement. So the, the first three letters after T, so the, the TESC part of test cruel, those are just variants of transhumanism. Cosmism, singularitarianism, extropianism, those are, are variants of transhumanism. Um, rationalism, effective altruism, long-termism, those were introduced by people who were very much involved in the transhumanist movement. So transhumanism is sort of the, the through line, uh, as it were, uh, the common denominator of all of these ideologies. And again, the central claim is that these ideologies form a single cohesive movement that has been instrumental, absolutely integral, in launching, sustaining, and accelerating the current race to build AGI. Hmm. So let me ask two questions to start off with. <clears throat> I want to get to this, but some you know news and things that have happened since we last spoke, so I want to get to those. But but continuing the background here, um, uh, if you could also explain, well, first, art of AGI, artificial general intelligence, the belief that the machine will be made to outdo our capabilities on a general basis. I, for one, think that's BS. It's not going to happen. I'll be eager to hear you know, if there's a, where, where you think that is on a scale of possibility. Two is that this is all related to what people people have probably heard more about is is doomerism, the doomsters, the people who think that this AGI could get so out of control it could destroy us, and a few people have the wisdom, having made it, to control it, and we should give them power and money. But the third thing I'd like you to address in that is how, and I think this is so critical for people to understand how all this relates to eugenics. When I try to scare people about what this stuff is, and I say, listen, it's not just a bunch of crazy geeks saying they're all powerful. It's got this larger agenda of making the new Ubermensch. And so if you don't mind extending your background for just another minute, if you could hit on those things, Emil. Sure. Yes. I mean, fantastic questions. Um, in terms of possibility, uh, my focus these days is mainly on the the us philosophers would say the normative question of whether we ought to build uh, AGI, as opposed to the question of whether or not it's it's even possible. So one of the the claims that Gabru and I make in our uh, article is that AGI is in, inherently unsafe because it's an unscoped system. So if if you want to um, if you want to apply established uh, um, standards of risk assessment to a technology, you need to first have, have a clear definition of what that technology is and what it's su supposed to do. So like the computers that we're using right now, like they're, they're, they're well-scoped. They have particular functions and so on. Once you understand those functions, you can apply these norms, these standards of risk analysis to determine how safe or unsafe the technology is. AGI is not like that. It's, it's this godlike system that uh, will be able to per perform at or above human level uh, intellectual uh, in terms of intellectual capabilities in every cognitive domain of interest. Mathematics, social persuasion, scientific innovation, uh, 
art, creativity, and so on and so on. So it's just an inherently unsafe. <laughs> Uh, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's possible. Maybe it is. Like Gary Marcus, for, for example, makes the argument that uh, the large language models that are powering uh, ChatGPT and various other chatbots, uh, a lot of the, the image uh, generate, generation uh, um, technologies that we, we have out there, these LLMs are an off-ramp to the road to AGI. So he's, in fact, he tweeted, I believe just today, that uh, he believes AGI will be built at some point, but not as a result of just scaling up these large language models. So there, there's a, my point of mentioning that is there's a variety of different views. My own opinion is like, I don't know, maybe AGI is possible. But again, I'm much more interested in the question of whether or not we should be trying to build AGI in the first place. Um, and, uh, you know, the, um, actually, this ties into uh, the, the second question about uh, doomerism. Um, there are sort of two camps within the Tesquerel movement. There are the, the doomers and the accelerations. Right. And it's, it's not, uh, it, there's a spectrum that separates them. So people can fall, you know, anywhere uh, along the spectrum in between those two extremes. Uh, the, I think the important thing to recognize is that all of the doomers, at least all of the, the most influential and prominent doomers within this test real tradition, they are not opposed to building AGI. They are opposed to building AGI in the near future. And so, you know, Elias Jankowski, maybe the, the most famous uh, AI doomer out there, Jan Talon would be another example, co-founder of the Future of Life Institute, and so on and so on. All of these individuals want AGI, and they want AGI as soon as possible. They just believe that we're not sufficiently prepared to build systems that are uh, at or above uh, human-level intelligence. So uh, above human-level intelligence, that would be referred to as superintelligence, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes abbreviated ASI for artificial superintelligence. So you've got AGI, which is a broad class, and then you've got ASI, which is a, a subclass of AGI, right? Because AGI would include human level. ASI is just superhuman intelligence. So all of these indiv individuals want AGI. One way to, to think about the situation and, and what motivates the Doomer uh, narrative, the, the, the Doomer movement within the, the test grill community is that you have AGI uh, capabilities research. So the capabilities research is focused on trying to build an actual system that does outperform humans in virtually all cognitive domains of interest. And then you've got AGI safety or AI safety. Um, and this is the, 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 the f a field that emerged directly out of the test real movement that is trying to, uh, to, un to, to solve a problem that's sometimes called the, the value alignment problem or the control problem. So if we create a system that is, is super intelligent, how exactly do we get it to do what we intend it to do? <laughs> so this, this is the alignment mm. problem. Um, if we ask it to uh, eliminate cancer, you know, all, all cancer in, in humans, maybe being uh, extremely clever, but also very sort of single-mindedly focused on this one particular goal, the ASI goes out and just kills everyone. Because mm -hmm. if you kill every, if, you, if there are no more humans, then there's no more human cancer. Yeah. Okay, so, so then you, you add a constraint that says, well, don't kill everyone. And so it goes, okay, I'll just kill most people around the world, but I'll, I'll leave you know, a million people in like a pen and I'll cover the rest of, of, the, of terrestrial earth with laboratories to try to cure cancer. And you go, okay, that's not what we want either. So you add another constraint. And the point of this exercise is that you can go through this iteratively over and over again, keep adding constraints. And then once those constraints are added, sort of figure out other ways that there could be catastrophic unintended consequences. So AI safety is trying to figure out uh, this problem of how it is that we, we uh, code into the system a set of values that aligns the behavior of the ASI with what we want uh, for the future of humanity. And so you've got AI safety and AI capabilities, or AGI safety, AGI capabilities. Right now, 
um, if, if time goes this way, uh, you've got capabilities that are here. Let's, let's say this is the AGI finish line. <laughs> That's where we get AGI. <laughs> you've got capabilities research here, and you've got AI safety research here. And so the claim is that if the uh, capabilities research crosses that finish line before AI safety research does, then you get, by default, a, a, catas a catastrophe. Meaning, probably everyone on Earth dies because there will just this will be create this this technology that is extremely extremely powerful that has agentic uh, properties. So it's an agent in its own right that makes it qualitatively different than any other kind of technology. There's no way to control it at that point. It's thinking a million times or or more than a million times faster than we are, which means that when it looks out at the world it sees us as essentially frozen in time. So maybe we're like struggling to go unplug the machine, but, but the two seconds it takes for us to unplug the machine, that in terms of subjective time for the ASI, that's like 200 years. So it's mm -hmm. got all the time in the world to like figure out how, how to prevent us from actually unplugging it. So, <laughs> so, so all of this is to say that the doomers are worried about this configuration where capabilities research is is leading the way with AI. You're, you're, you're so extremely, in what I still think is BS, you're so extremely fair to them, giving <laughs> yeah. them an appropriate, I think they would say, explanation of what they see. So I appreciate that intellectually. It's spot, I mean, it's spot on. It's an excellent visualization. It really yeah. encapsulates exactly what, what, yeah, what we're up against. Yeah. So yeah, sorry so, I interrupted. No, that's fine. I, I mean, I, I, I am trying to be charitable. I mean, I think that they're, <laughs> There, uh, you know, the, a lot of the problems within AI safety, I think, are um, are the problems themselves are deeply problematic, are flawed in various ways. The frameworks are all wrong. Um, so I, I have, you know, this would be a charitable interpretation of of, uh, uh, of their view. And also, the reason I, I mention it this way is is just to say that as soon as as the situation reverses and AI safety is ahead of AI capabilities, all of the doomers would say pedal to the metal, because AGI or superintelligence is absolutely key. It is integral for realizing this this very bizarre techno utopian vision that is motivating the test girl movement according to which we will use superintelligence to figure out ways to completely re-engineer humanity, essentially resulting in, uh, almost certainly resulting in the extinction of our species. Maybe that would happen in the very near future. Test list would be completely fine if there were no more homo sapiens and we were replaced by some new post-human species. So in, in a sense, the test movement is very pro-extinctionist. You know, don't, don't let their rhetoric <laughs> fool you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not only will we re-engineer humanity, but we go out and colonize space, we plunder the cosmos for its vast resources, what they call our cosmic endowment of neg entropy, which stands for negative entropy. So just basically usable uh, energy. So, and part of the plan then is to build literally planet-sized computers on which to run uh, virtual reality worlds where you could have trillions and trillions of people. Uh, some of these individuals, um, like Nick Bostrom, who has been involved in every single one of the test grill ideologies from the T to the L. Uh, he estimates that if we colonize space, there could be on the order of 10 to the 58 digital people in the future. Uh, so that's a lot of people that, that amount, that number, so that's a one followed by 58 zeros. That is a much, 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 much <laughs> larger number than the total number of people who exist today. Uh, so that makes the future way more important than the present, which in turn motivates this idea that we need to build safe superintelligence according to whereby AI safety leads the way uh, in front of AI capabilities as we cross the AGI finish line. But we need to do that as soon as possible. So, because once we have superintelligence, then we get to live forever. We get to become post human We get to colonize space and create this literally astronomical amount of value in the, the far future. So uh, to, to, to sort of um, summarize key points here, the difference between the acceleration, accelerationists and the doomers is, is important, but also very slight because both of them share the exact same vision of the future. It's about going out and conquering the universe, becoming 
post-human beings uploading our minds and so on. That is the vision. All of them accept essentially the exact same uh, future logical picture uh, that we, we ought to be striving towards. They just disagree about the near-term risks of AGI. So people like Yudkowsky, famous doomer, uh, arguably the most influential doomer in the world today, thinks that if we create AGI in the near future, there is a 99% chance or greater that everybody on Earth will die. And that would be very bad. His institute, called the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, just released their 2024 communication strategy document. And if you look at, foot, I believe it's footnote number one, they say right there, do we think we should never build superintelligence? No, we need to build superintelligence as soon as possible. It is a key part of fulfilling our long-term potential over the coming millions, billions, and trillions of years. But we just need to make sure that AI safety is in front of AI capabilities. And so the accelerationists just think, actually, you know, the default outcome of building AGI in the near future is utopia. It's not doom. And so we shouldn't worry so much. And in fact, even if there are risks, this is another key claim that a lot of accelerationists make, even if there are risks associated with AGI, the best way to solve those risks is not through like government regulation or you know, something of that sort. It's through the free market. So if we just you know, open source everything, we have a thousand or a million companies out there that are all building their own AGIs or their own super intelligences, then okay, like maybe there's like 10 you know, apocalyptically bad AGIs. Sure, but there's a million good AGIs that are going to neutralize. Be even smarter. This is, this, is, this is Mark Andreessen's gospel. Exactly, yeah. 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 So it's, I feel like I spoke a lot there, uh, no, but no, I, you, I got to much. at least two of your questions. So, <laughs> well, yeah, real quick, real quickly, are you generous? Real quickly. Um, ah, yes. Um, so I would say that um, maybe the first thing to note is that, so, I mean, eugenics is this idea that there are ways of uh, traditionally um, ways to alter the reproductive patterns of a population to improve humanity. Uh, this idea it goes back to the very origins of the Western tradition. Ancient Roman law, the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, both endorsed eugenic policies like infanticide, uh, uh, targeting specifically uh, babies with um, congenital deformities. and. And this idea has popped up over and over again throughout Western history. In the decade after uh, Charles Darwin published the origin on the origin of species, uh, 1859 was when he published that. Um, I think it was exactly 10 years later, if I'm remembering correctly, his half cousin, Francis Galton, published a book called Hereditary Genius, which introduced the first quote unquote scientific version of eugenics, uh, whereby he was using Darwin's theory of uh, evolution by natural selection um, to argue that we should be able to use something like natural selection, a kind of artificial selection, to uh, encourage the, the best, the most fit individuals to reproduce more while preventing uh, individuals who are, are the least fit, quote unquote, <laughs> from re reproducing. And then over, you know, transgenerationally, over many generations, uh, the human population will improve. Our health will improve, will become uh, smarter and, and so on. And so this was, th th this was so-called scientific uh, eugenics. Um, eugenics was hugely uh, popular uh, among bo both sides of the political spectrum, uh, particularly in the early 20th century. Progressives loved it. Fascists loved it. The Nazis, of course, made it uh, uh, quite famous and dreaded. <laughs> uh, I mean, they sterilized, I think, 400,000 people or, or so in, in Germany. So all, all of the, the reason I'm, I'm digressing here is to say that um, eugenics has, goes back to the beginning of the Western tradition, and it's never gone away. And so consequently, there were two French scholars who talked about the eternal return of eugenics. And one of the claims that Gabru and I make is that the Tesquerel movement is just the most recent iteration right. of the eternal return of eugenics. So transhumanism itself is a version of eugenics. 
That is uncontroversial. You can go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, look it up. It's a kind of eugenics. Um, and in fact, it was developed in the 20th century by some of the most prominent eugenicists uh, in the Western world, like Julian Huxley would be a, a prime example. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the difference between transhumanism and eugenics, uh, this gets at why I call transhumanism eugenics on steroids, because the, tr the traditional eugenicists in the, of the, the 20th century, going back to the late 19th century, what they wanted to do was use science, reason, maybe technology uh, to uh, improve the human stock as much as possible to, to create the most perfect version of our species that we could actually create while simultaneously preventing our species from evolutionarily degenerating over time. Transhumanists like Julian Huxley said, why stop there? Why stop at perfecting humanity? Why not transcend humanity? Why not create, he didn't use the term post-human, but he, he was employing the concept in arguing that we should just transcend humanity entirely and just be become a new superior species. And so this idea then combined with uh, the fact that there were breakthroughs in certain fields of technology in the second half of the 20th century from like the 1970s onwards, um, like genetic engineering. And so for the first time people thought like, okay, if the, trans if the, the eugenics on steroids, i.e. transhumanist goal is to create this superior new species, call them post-humans. Um, and now we have these technologies that enable us to actually modify our genes. And maybe there's like AI systems that we could merge with or nanotechnology that uh, um, we could you know, inject, nanobots we can inject into our bloodstream that enhance our cognitive functioning, uh, enable us to live forever and so on. Then actually we don't need the old techniques of 20th century uh, eugenics, where like forced sterilization and you know stuff that was aimed at changing population level patterns of reproduction. No, in a single lifetime, over a single generation, if you're talking about parents and children, we may be able to use these emerging technologies to radically modify ourselves. And so this is this is how modern transhumanism was born. It was this it was this marriage between this eugenics on steroids idea of transcending humanity and the fact that these emerging technologies were being developed and sort of the realization that, yeah, these, Rick Kurzweil calls them GNR technologies, genetics, nanotech, and robotics, which includes AI. These GNR technologies could enable us to just radically uh, modify ourselves to become post-humans ourselves. <laughs> um, and so one thing then to, one implication of this is that because all of the test real ideologies emerged out of the backbone that is modern transhumanism. All of these ideologies directly came out of a modern eugenics movement. All of them are infused and imbued by the, the, uh, the, the legacies, the, the values, um, the ideas that are central to the eugenics movement. Um, and so in a very, I think really important sense, the entire AGI race by virtue of being driven and inspired by the test real worldview. The entire AGI race is uh, infected with- uh, That's a good with, way to put it. Hmm. it. It doesn't mean that it's essentially that, but it's infected by that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, but I would say, I mean, once you, you start to sort of look around the, the literature surrounding AGI, I mean, there's, there's just it's evidence. It's in it all, yeah. It's in it all. I mean, there, there was integrated. a- one of the, the examples uh, that got a lot of attention uh, maybe a year ago or so was that the, uh, some researchers published this article um, titled, I believe it was Sparks of AGI. Um, at the Sparks paper is how it's, it's known. And it claimed that in uh, GPT 3.5, GPT 4, um, you can find the evidence of general intelligence. Uh, these systems are, you know, actually getting us closer to the, the ultimate goal, the, the holy grail, which is human level intelligence. That is, and the reason I mention this is that uh, their definition of intelligence came directly from an individual who argued that certain racial groups 
are uh, um, intellectually, for genetic reasons, intellectually inferior to other groups. So, I mean, th this is a... Uh, it's all tied together. It's all tied together. So you, you see traces and residues of the worst aspects of 20th century eugenics all over the Tescrial movement and all over discussions about, uh, about AGI. So I, I do think there's a, there's a kind of sub, s substantial connection there. Um, That's it's, really it's not Thank you. It's not a mere association. Yeah. So, so I guess the question that comes up for me then is, you know, because we continue time and time again to hear about the march towards AGI. Yes, from the people that you point out in your your FAQ, Nick Bostrom, Sam Altman, Elon Musk, and the others who, you know, could could very easily be looked at and fit into the test reel kind of bucket. But you also hear about it from people who are just, you know, coming from the perspective of, well, this is just the natural evolution of the way we work with technologies is that technology is always about pushing forward and progress and in, in air quotes and stuff. And it doesn't it isn't AGI isn't a, you know, widely wise and almost humanistic technology that you know is as powerful as we are if not more isn't that the obvious end game of what we're trying to do as people who are building technologies um i mean is it possible to do agi responsibly in in light of everything you're saying here um i mean maybe but i i think we would need a completely different framework uh mm. so a couple things come to mind when you you mentioned this one is that um you know, 20 years ago, uh, really before, I, I mean, maybe even just 10 years ago, almost nobody was talking about AGI. Right. There was a huge amount of research in the field of AI, but it was mostly focused on sort of narrow AI uh, uh, projects, narrow AI technologies. Mm -hmm. And so these are technologies that focus mm -hmm. on a, a particular task. Um, AGI is different. It is supposed to be this universal technology. You can, you can use it, the same exact algorithm or algorithms in any domain, and it will outperform humans, as opposed to earlier work, which was just focusing on like de designing this particular algorithm, which will do this specific thing. Uh, in which case, oftentimes, the you know, established standards for risk assessment are applicable and are useful. <laughs> um, and so what, what caused that shift from these sort of this focus on narrow AI to artificial general intelligence? It was the test crew individuals, right, right. you know, mm. who, who said we, we have this universal system that is the key to techno utopia. Um, and so uh, I, I, I suspect maybe there are ways of just trying to build some kind of more general system that are responsible. But the fact is we live in this particular timeline <laughs> and mm -hmm. this particular timeline has been, you know, the reason where we are, where we are right now with billions of dollars being funneled into these companies that are explicitly trying to build, ultimately to build super intelligence um, is because these individuals shifted the, uh, the discussion. They, they, they changed the landscape of the field of AI because their Tescrural techno-utopian vision appealed to billionaires, <laughs> you know, who want mm -hmm. to live forever, want to colonize space. So the billionaires yeah. were like, okay, mm -hmm. I'll give you, you know, a huge amount of money to start DeepMind or OpenAI, whatever. Uh, and so that's how we ended up here. And it, it's why I would say just the, the whole framework is, is, you know, deeply problematic. Um, we need to jettison the whole framework, I think, and start again, and well, uh, and then maybe there is a, a path towards more general systems that that would you know be responsible and it, not it associated like, with this tech utopian hype. Sorry for talking mm -hmm. over you. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, that's why you're here, um, <laughs> Jason. In response to your question, I'm, I'm curious what Emil will say about this. Um, the way I've been looking at it, and I've, I think I've said it on the show, is I see the, the the general is not a bad word because it's a general machine, and we're concentrating too much on the technology as if it had full agency, which is part of the question. But to me, it's a general machine. And that means that, that uh, AI, the subset LLMs, like the printing press, are general machines. That is to say that anybody could make them do anything. And thus, to think that we can build in 
guardrails and safety into it is foolhardy. The issue isn't the technology. The issue is us as human beings. And there is no way to predict how human beings, malign human beings, or accident, or even well-intentioned human beings doing things accidentally, every possible bad thing that they could ever do with this. And so um, that also leads to a question. That, so, so, so to me, the idea that we can build in this kind of safety, I think, is foolhardy and, and, and um, ignores the reality of where we have. We have an amoral machine. It's, not a, it's just it's, it's amoral. It doesn't have morality. And so trying to hold the model makers responsible for what happens with everything that could ever happen with a model maker. There's legislation in California right now that says that uh, model makers have to sign a statement under penalty of criminal perjury that their systems are safe versus the author, the user, whether that's Martin Luther with the printing press or whether that's some schmuck who uses an LLM to do something dastardly. Uh, that's where a lot of the responsibility lies. And I think we're looking at it as if the technology matters when it's the humanity that matters. Does that make any sense to you? It does, yeah. And sorry, sorry for the noise uh, just a moment ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. um, yeah, so it, it, it does. I, I actually, um, you know, um, I mean, feel free to, to, to push back if you, if you think mm -hmm. I'm wrong about this or if I've misunderstood your position. But I, I sort of think that there are, there's a tension between two of the things that you said uh, maybe, again, maybe I'm wrong, but on the one hand, this idea that technology is just kind of neutral thing. Um, I, no, not neutral at all. It, okay. it, it has prejudices, but it doesn't, but you have to include in your calculation of what it does, how we choose to make it do something, how we design it or how we ask it to do things or what our input is that the humanity has an impact that I think is being ignored in this discussion as if the technology were in um, a separate being. That's more what I'm trying to say. Okay, so I, I think we're in total agreement then. Um, you know, I, I see technology as, um, in general, in the vast majority of cases, maybe all cases, as as a non-neutral entity. Mm -hmm. So there is the 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 it's in in the philosophical vocabulary. It is uh, the value neutrality thesis. This idea that uh, you know technology is just this inner thing, and it's entirely up to the user uh, whether or not the. Oh, I see what the, you're saying. Right. Right. Yeah. So guns don't kill people. Right, people right. kill people is a classic. But actually, I, I, you know, a lot of philosophers of technology would say no. Technology is absolutely infused with the values of its creators, which I think gets at your point. These AI systems aren't just like, like all of the, the talk, uh, the vast majority of talk tends to be on, to focus on these technologies. Is Are these AI technologies themselves dangerous? And you, you sort of forget about the fact that there's a huge amount of human labor that goes into the creation of these technologies, that their design is the result of intentional decisions <laughs> that humans have made. So this gets at why I, I've tweeted on many occasions, I'm much more worried about AI companies and the individuals who are leading these AI companies than I am about AI. Because you're totally right that it's- Yes, yes, exactly. I couldn't agree more. In, in, you're yeah. quoted at length in my upcoming book. Do I have a copy here? Yes, I do. Um, the web we weave, I gotta always be selling. Always Very be nice. Uh, and at the end, I say what scares me is not the technology, but the people. And, mm -hmm. and it's because of you showing me the crazy crap that these people believe in. Let me let me switch, if I can, to uh, two news things around mm -hmm. this. I'm curious, uh, since we last talked, no one was covering Test Real. Mm -hmm. It was hard to get it into media. I think it's still extremely difficult to get it to get journalists. Um, the New Yorker has done a big thing about the long-termers, and they just completely ignore all the bad sides that you pointed out. And, yes. you know, they can present somebody's view of the world that's okay, but at least, for God's sakes, do the reporting. They're not doing it. They're not calling you. They're not quoting you enough, both you yeah. and Kim Um two, two quick news things. One is the, the, the Guardian, um, not too long ago, let's see, when was this? In uh, June 16, so very recently, reported on Sam Beckman fried's um, Ta is to a uh, an organization with uh, racist, that is to say, eugenics um, roots, and it mentions Desreal. Yay! Right. Um, and the other thing that is the person you've already mentioned, who's kind of the philosopher king of of the Tescrealists, 
um, Nick Bostrom, uh, got ousted from Oxford and his center there got defunded. Uh, do you think that there's um, a little bit of traction around the reporting you've done here and awareness of this, or are these random events? I think there is growing interest in the idea and a growing recognition that this concept is important for understanding what's going on. I mean, I, I, I've said before that the, I think one of the virtues of the test rule acronym, in addition to the fact that it presents the ideologies uh, in roughly the same order that they emerged historically. Um, but, you know, one of the, the sort of, you know, philosophical theories about what explanations are supposed to do is that a good explanation unifies. So a good, you know, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, there's just this vast amount of data out there, all these different phenomena, and it, it organizes them all under a single uh, idea. So that, that is to say that I think the test rule concept does that as well, because, you know, I, I've spoken to scholars uh, on numerous occasions over the, the past, you know, year, year and a half, who, some of whom have gone to Silicon Valley and embedded themselves in these communities. And they've told me like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I know transhumanism is like, it's, it's, it, you know, it's omnipresent in Silicon Valley. It's the water that these people swim in. It's the air that they, that they breathe. Um, and also like long-termism, but like how exactly does, you know, EA fit into that? Like long-termism is kind of a version of EA. And then there's the rationalist community, which is kind of a sibling community to, to EA. And there's a huge, um, sociological overlap. A lot of people who consider themselves EAs or also rationalists and so on. And then when they heard the test term, they were like, okay, that is so useful. It just, yeah. it, it's just yeah. unified. It provides this unifying. Exactly. Framework. It does. Um, so I, I think that's part of the appeal. I think people are, are, are starting to recognize like, oh, actually it is useful to, in trying to make sense of where this AGI race came from, what's sustaining it, what, what is, is accelerating it. Um, you know, half of the picture is at least at this point profit, right? But mm -hmm. but these AI companies are unique um, in the topography, in the, the sort of capitalist landscape <laughs> that that's the, the milieu that we're all uh, um, in. You know, fossil fuel companies they're motivated. You know, how do you explain their behavior? Profit motive. <laughs> you know, and then right. you have pretty mm -hmm. much a complete explanation. These AI companies, DeepMind, OpenAI, Anthropic, XAI, and so on. Um, how do you explain their behavior? Well, profit motive is is a part of the, the picture. Also when, it, when, when capitalism becomes a religion with these overtones, it, you, it's yeah. hard to then beat it down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, so capitalism has become intertwined with, um, I mean, there, there's a sense in which the test grill vision of the future is just techno-capitalism yeah. on steroids. Right. <laughs> you know, It's about going out, maximizing value, Mm -hmm. Plundering the cosmos, colonizing, ex, you know, expanding, extracting, and, and so on and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think, um, yeah, test realism is the other key part of the picture. And I think people are starting to, to recognize that, you know, back in late 2022. So this was when long-termism was just starting to get some, uh, some attention from the media. And that was because William McCaskill, uh, co-founder of the Effective Altruist Movement, had just published his book, What We Owe the Future. And he was on The Daily Show. He got coverage in New York Times, New Yorker, uh, Time Magazine, and so on. So people were just sort of scratching their head, going, like, what is this long-termist ideology? What, you know, where did this come from? Like, you know, what does it think we ought to be striving towards collectively as, as a species? Um, and so I remember talking to a number of journalists, because I was in the long-termist community for 10 years. I mean, I was a true believer. I, I'm, I'm literally listed as the, uh, I believe it's the fifth or the sixth, I can't remember, fifth or sixth most prolific contributor to the existential <laughs> risk <laughs> academic literature, which is, you know, existential risk is the key concept within the long-termist movement. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. I have, I have a certain street cred. So I talk to these reporters and I tell them, here's what the vision is. It's about re-engineering humanity, colonizing space, creating computer size, uh, uh, planet-sized computers to run virtual reality worlds. And, and over and over again, the journalists would come back to me uh, a month later and say that 
I spoke to my editor and there's no way yeah. we're going to publish yeah. the interview or the article because my editor told me whoever I spoke to like clearly just is exaggerating or doesn't know what they're talking about or whatever. And then the end of the story is that invariably there were probably like five cases like this, uh, maybe more. Six months later, I get those same journalists coming back to me saying my editor told me whoever you spoke to before, go talk to them again. Because <laughs> we need to do a story about this. Because people just, once people had a bit of yeah. time yeah. To, to actually, you know, sort of like listen to what Bankman Freed and McCaskill and, 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 and so on have to say, or actually read some of the papers that I had recommended um, that are, are canonical, you know, really influential mm -hmm. within the, the Tuscarill literature, they realized, oh, actually, I'm really not exaggerating. I'm not being hyperbolic at all. This really is the vision. So I think that's also partly why um, this uh, this Tuscarill concept seems to be gaining some traction, now has a has a Wikipedia page, which is <laughs> kind of nice. Yeah, which, uh, which was taken down and is now back up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually had a friend at who's a, a postdoc at Stanford, and there was a uh, undergraduate. He told me this uh, a couple months ago. Undergraduate who walked in, uh, who he'd never met, and the, they got to talking. And at some point, the undergrad said, "Can I ask you just kind of an odd, random question? Do you know what test rule stands for?" And this is just some some random kid at Stanford. So, yeah, the, the idea seems to be making the rounds. Uh, hopefully, because it's it's a, again a useful framework. Well, Emil, I can't believe sense. how much fun you make it talking about doom. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it is it is intellectually fascinating. Yeah, captivating. Captivating. Yeah. It's good work, Chris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I like the you know, I, I am actually like deeply, deeply pessimistic about the future, but there there's a line that I, I heard a couple years ago, which is like, yeah, I'm uh, you know, I'm I'm pessimistic, gloomy, uh or, you know, I I am pessimistic, hopeless, whatever, but that's no reason to be gloomy. <laughs> that was the, the, the line. <laughs> and I feel that. There's yeah. Might, might as well have, have a, a chuckle. So yeah, thank you for the for, for the for the nightmares and the chuckles together. I, I, <laughs> there we go. Oh, all living <laughs> harmoniously while they still can uh, together. Uh, Emil, uh, really appreciate you taking time uh, again. Yeah, one of the questions that I had, which you totally uh, talked about, was how far Tesreal as an understanding has come since the last time we talked to you. Because definitely, when the last time we talked to you, it felt like a terminology, and it was a terminology that was still pretty young. And I've mm -hmm. certainly seen a lot more of it bouncing around uh, the AI circles, that understanding of, of what it means. And you're the perfect person to talk about it. So thank you for thank you so much. coming back with us today to talk about this. I, you know, I have plenty of questions that we didn't have time to get to. So we'll have to have you back again. Um, Xriskology.substack.com for people who want to go Yes, of course, read the FAQ on the Test Grail bundle, but all of uh, Emil's uh, writings on their sub, sub stack can be found there. Anything else you want to point people to before we let you go, Emil? Uh, maybe Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, X, um, for some reason, no, it's, it's Twitter. Twitter it. It's Twitter. <laughs> okay, Twitter. <laughs> so X Riskology. Uh, yeah. at, uh, on Twitter. I do still tweet a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. That's a good place to, to keep it's in touch. It's hard to stop. And yeah, pe people should reach out if they have any questions or uh, I'm always eager to, to chat with people. So, Excellent. Thanks yeah, so well, much. We appreciate your time and your kindness. Thanks, thank you for doing what you do, Emil. And we'll talk with you soon. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. All right. <laughs> take, take care. care. All right. Fascinating. Knew it would be. Um, We've been to this rodeo before. They're just great. Emil. I mean, every yeah. time you just like, get, like get as captivated as the, as the right word. Because uh, yeah. the research is deep. The understanding of this is deep. Um mm -hmm. And uh, and it's important. It's it's really important. And I want people to pay attention to uh, to what they're uh, reporting on. Thank you, everybody, for watching this wonderful interview with Emil Torres. I uh, hope we didn't depress you too much. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, please let us know in the comments what do you think about breaking out these interviews into their own video on YouTube. Uh, we're really kind of playing around with ideas here to see what you like, what you connect with, and your feedback is instrumental to how we develop this channel and this show. So let us know down below in the comments. We'll see you next time. Bye.